come with some mixed emotions. It's been uh, such a great experience to get to know Tara and Christian and to see them all of this time together culminate with them dedicating their life to Jesus Christ. And as we think about 2022, our year of hope, where we want to focus this year on remembering the things that will keep us going because there's a lot of things around us right now that are discouraging, isn't there? But at the same time, hope takes different shapes. Hope is not always something that happens here today, but sometimes will happen in the future. And as we think of a good friend of our church who has passed away last night, Carl Bryant, and just a, a respectable man who served his country, served his family well, and unfortunately fell to COVID-19. And uh, we remember him, and surely our prayers are with you and your two sons as you mourn the loss of a pillar in your family. And this is where hope comes into play even more when we know that we've lost someone too early and we know that this is not the end and that there will be a better time. There will be a better day. I thank you so much for those songs. So appropriate. Today we're going to do what we call a communion. And um, right now, for those of you who are here, we have hundreds, if not 200 people at home right now watching. And we told them to stay home today because uh, in the 70 Avenue Church, when we do the communion service, we wash each other's feet and we take the bread and the, and the wine that was talked about in those songs, an act of humility that was given to us by Jesus and a remembrance that allows us to relive and to understand the salvation that we live in every day through the grace. We are faithful, like the song says, because of God's grace. And so if you're visiting with us today, feel very comfortable to watch. You don't have to participate. If you want to, you're more than welcome. Um, and for those of you at home, um, I'm glad that you've joined us this morning. I hope you join us in time to witness, uh, you know, the beginning of the year, the first two Sabbaths, and we always have four baptisms, two, Lainey and, and Felicia last weekend, and now Tara and Christian. And, and the joy for me is to now grow with you, to grow with you in the faith of Jesus Christ and to see you witness to others and allow them the same chance to grow. And so today I thought I would, I would share something that would may be redundant to some of you who've been in the church for a long time. But my message this morning is for those of you who may not have understood why people believe in this God and this Jesus. And I'm going to unravel some things to you today that may surprise you. And I hope it does. I hope it does. Um... I love animals, and as many of you do as well, and uh, I know many of you love animals because I've pretty much visited everybody in this church, and uh, some of you are upset at me that I don't remember your dog's name or your cat's name or your lizard's name, and, and so, uh, but I, I know a lot of you have animals, and when I was younger, I used to love to go to the pet store and, uh, and watch the, the, the tanks and all the different fish and the different colors and and then I'd go to the area where there were dogs and cats and I would love to just watch them and and then you know go look at the exotic animals like the snakes and the hairy spiders and all that stuff and uh, and uh, I, I don't like it as much as I used to now because I I feel kind of sad for those animals because you know to be a fish in a tank this big it's, that's not a fish you know uh, to be a cat in a cage, you know, they can't, they can't freely roam. Uh, they can't be what they were created to be. And the thing that's even more difficult to accept, I think, is that when they're in a place like that, they start to believe that that's home. And I'll tell you why I say that. I'd like to introduce you to one of the loves of my life, and his name was Buttons. He is no longer with us. He passed away. Uh, some while ago, and I remember one morning getting up, and he was sitting on my Bible, and I was like, okay, well, 
let's read it together, Buttons. <laughs> and, um, and Buttons, you know, we, we acquired him from the SPCA, and he was in a cage. And it was very apparent when we brought him home that he needed to be hidden. He didn't want to be in the open. Uh, when we first got him, he would always hide. Uh, sometimes he would go for days. We wouldn't know where he was. And then we would hear our duck work. <coughs> he even hid in our duct work once. Like he somehow climbed through the ceiling. And, you know, Tina was able to coax him out with food and treats. And, and even after a while, when he stopped, stopped hiding, he would always sit under something. He would lie under a chair, under a table. Uh, he would go under the bed. He was not comfortable if he didn't have something above his head. And of course, over time, he became uh, more comfortable. He began to trust us. And he no longer needed to be under things. He started to go outside and he would roam. I mean, it became his kingdom. The place was, it was his. And, uh, you know, he would trust us and we would be able to pick him up and hold him in our arms. Of course, not all pets were in cages. Some of you may have a pet that somebody gave to you, uh, a pet that lived on a farm or something like that. But I want to challenge you this morning that human beings live in a cage. And much like buttons in some of our pets in our homes, we are bought. And, and, and it's a Bible verse. Uh, nestled in, in, in the New Testament in a book called 1 Corinthians 6.20. All that means is that somebody wrote a letter to the church in Corinth. That's, that's all that means. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Bible. And so this guy wrote a letter to a church in Corinth. And he says there, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which now are God's. I don't know how you feel about the idea of being bought, but it makes me feel a little bit uneasy. I think it would leave this world, or anybody who's not familiar with the Bible, uneasy unless it was properly explained. I mean, people are bought all the time, right? Meaning that they will sell their principle or their soul for the right price. Or for centuries, our history uh, has been darkened by the idea that people have been bought and treated as merchandise. The, this very verse has existential uh, proportions because it alludes to the fact that we are owned. And this world, if we're honest enough with ourselves, we really want to believe that we own ourselves. But it's not true. And even more troubling is the idea that there are at least two owners. Because if God bought, he must have given something to someone in order to have us. God is the one who bought, and then there's the other one who we were bought from. Interestingly, the word bought here... Uh, has, you know, the, 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 the Bible was actually written in original languages. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and in the New Testament in Greek. Now we have English Bibles and we have so many of them that we get more confused. But uh, when you go back to the original text, the word bought here actually means redeemed. And the word redeem means to be liberated or delivered through an exchange. I think you may know where I'm trying to get with this. Uh, the idea of redemption is common for a lot of people. There's two definitions from the dictionary. One is compensate for the fault or bad aspect of something. For example, I like to pick on my Toronto Maple Leaf fans. That was a horrible performance from the Toronto Maple Leafs. Only redeemed by the tasty hot dogs at the concession stands. That would be an example of replacing something bad with something good. Even though I don't think hot dogs are good, but I think you get my point. 
Or the second definition, gain or regain possession of something in exchange or payment. After the thieves entered my home, my dentures had to be redeemed from the pawnbroker. I, I have real teeth, so it's not my, it's not my quote. So now we, 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 we go back to this concept of liberation. We go back to, to the idea of deliverance when we think of, of bots. It's, it, 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 it's a transaction that frees, that liberates. And in preparing for this special service, both of, of, of baptism and, and, and of the commun communion today, I was touched by the thought that we are bought. And that our response to this supposedly good news is that we are to glorify God in our body and in our spirits. Which is exactly what this meant and what the communion service means. It dawned upon me, and I knew this before, but boy, oh boy, am I stubborn, and do I need to hear it over and over again, that salvation, this deliverance, this liberation, the hope to glory with God in heaven one day, the freedom, the peace, the comfort, and the confidence in Jesus Christ, our Savior, has nothing to do with me, because the thing that is being bought can't do anything about it. Without a buyer, I am just merchandise sitting on a shelf. Living a shelf life, thinking that that's all there is to life. This is the problem with being on the shelf. That's the problem with being in a cage. That's the problem with being in a tank. We begin to think that that's all that life has to offer. The act of buying solely belongs to the one with the money, not to the merchandise. And yes, I said it. I'm sorry if you're offended. You are merchandise. I am merchandise. Not because we were created that way, but because our current owner treats us that way. And sellers today have all kinds of ploys to make their merchandise more buyable, right? I don't know if you've ever sold, uh, not stolen, sold a car on Kijiji, but supposedly if you put the car in front of water, a puddle of water, and then there's a reflection of the car, you have a 50% more chance of selling the car. How many of us would ever go on a dating website with our hair all messed up and no makeup? Well, maybe some people do. Maybe Boris Johnson would. <laughs> I don't know. We stage our homes, right? You pay people thousands of dollars to put furniture that doesn't belong to you, to take down the, the pictures that you think are totally amazing, and then they end up changing the whole place so that the house will be more sellable. Our owner, uh, let me just ask the question. Who's our owner? Huh? Who's our owner? This is why I need to preach this sermon. Satan is our owner. Satan is the owner of this place. That's the harsh reality. That's the harsh reality. And yeah, Melissa said something. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. She's right. But let's just... Let's just Let's just talk about the truth. Let's just talk about what's really happening out here, right? And our owner messed up. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But you heard me right. You and I belong to Satan. Labeled by the Bible, Satan is labeled by the Bible as the father of lies, as the deceiver, and the author of destruction, pain, and sorrow. That's who owns us. That's who owns this world. Evil is our owner. The world may deny it because the devil knows how to just give us enough to make us feel like we matter and that we have a purpose. But in reality, he wants to bring this world to destruction just like his impending doom. I, 
you know, on the news, they have this thing called the moment. And every day they bring out something positive. We really do try to make this place feel like it's the way it should be. But I think deep down inside of all of us, we know that it's not the way it should be. And the reason why he's the owner is because we gave it to him. The Bible is very clear in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Genesis means beginning, right? So the first book in the Bible at creation, the first chapter, it says that God gave who the dominion over this earth? Who? Who had dominion over this earth? Man. Right? Now, if you don't believe in creation, then this, just throw this out, okay? Because, because this, is, this is not going to work for you. But if, if, you, if you realize that there's a creator and that there's intent, purpose, and intelligent design behind everything that's around us, then God made it, put man there, and says, you shall have dominion over the fish, over the birds, over the, the trees, over everything. And then the devil shows up in a form of a snake. And he says, you don't know everything. If you knew everything, then you would be like God. But he's keeping you ignorant so that he can lord it over you. And guess what? Then the man and the woman believed it. And in believing the snake, in believing Satan, they ended up handing over in a silver platter what they had dominion over. Now, you may not believe me, and that's okay. I'll give you a Bible verse that talks about, this is very interesting. In Luke chapter 4, Luke is in the New Testament. Luke was a doctor, and he was one who uh, really followed Jesus and believed in him. And so Jesus at one point, after he gets baptized, he was 27 years old, and he gets baptized, much like Tara and, and, and Christian did, and then he goes into the wilderness, into the desert, for 40 days without eating and drinking. Just to really, this is the beginning of his new job. So before this, he was a carpenter with his dad. And after this, he became for three and a half years the one who shook the whole world by sharing parables and sharing stories and ultimately giving up his life that we're going to symbolize through communion today. And so he's there, he's fasting, and guess who shows up? The devil. Because he always shows up when we're at our weakest. So Jesus is starving, he's thirsty, and the devil shows up and he says, you know what? He takes him up on a high mountain and he shows him all the kings of the world in a moment of time. And the devil says to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me. And I can give it to whoever I want. And Jesus doesn't say, no, it wasn't given to you. It belongs to me. No. He didn't deny it that this place was given to Satan on a silver platter by us, because we had dominion, and now he has dominion. Then there's the words of Jesus, and I want to focus on this. Just before he dies, he's sitting in the room with his disciples, and he's talking with them not long before he's about to die. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Even Jesus admits before he dies that Satan is a ruler of this world. And then he says, and I, Jesus, if I will be lifted up from this earth, I will draw all people to me. Jesus admits that Satan is a ruler of this world, but more importantly, he identifies how we can change our ownership. If he is lifted up from the earth, he will draw many people to him. But since we gave the authority that was rightfully ours to Satan at creation, the only thing God can do is to buy us out of impending doom. Come on, this is, this, is, this, this is deep. We don't belong to him. We were stolen. We, we even though uh, through co 
conniving words and decep deception, we gave it up. We became owned by Satan. Satan took us from God. And God, I know this will sound really difficult for some of you to hear, God cannot fix this world. Because it no longer belongs to Him. But He can draw people to a better life. He could make this world better if everybody wanted it. But that's not the case. And He no longer rules over this world. He is humble and selfless enough to say, this place doesn't belong to me anymore. But we all hold on to the promise that one day he will make it new. And it will belong to him. But as long as sin is here and the devil rules. But we know that at the cross, everything changed. It says here, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Just not yet. See, God can offer redemption. I, I just like to make these big words simple if I can. I, I, I call it freedom. Freedom from sin, from guilt, from shame, from slavery, from tanks, and from cages. You know, the symbol of a tank and a cage is the idea that what is around us is the best to come and is what we can, all that we have. And outside the tank and outside the cage, there is much more. But it takes a certain amount of boldness to go into that tank and to say, Yes, Jesus, I can't save myself. I need you. I'm out of the tank. Thanks to you. And wisdom, I love this. The knowledge that there is more than meets the eye. The understanding that God is love. And the maturity to learn from the hard knocks of life. We often blame God when something bad happens. And God says, no, it's not me. But I want you to learn through it. Because if I prevent evil, I control everyone. And I'm not a control freak. I love. And because I love, I give people freedom to choose. Redemption gives us that freedom and that wisdom. And the only way it can be done is through a legal transaction. Not with money, because Satan has all the wealth in the world. And, and not with authority, because Satan is the authority over this world. So what is it, what is the only thing that God could exchange that would buy us? A life. The only fair legal transaction, the only one that Satan would accept, is if God was to die in order for me to live. Because Satan's penalty is death. Therefore, if that's my penalty, and you want to save these poor wretched freaks, these people in cages and in tanks, then you got to die. That's not the way God wants it, of course. But that's the only way God can reflect, Satan can reflect. Because Satan has no love except for himself. And the only thing that matters to God is that it will not cost us anything. That's the only thing that matters to God. He created us in his image, and he wants to recreate us in his image. Because sin has done quite a number on us, hasn't it? For some of us, sin has left some really, really, really deep scars. Scars that we are still maybe have not recovered from today. And for some of us, maybe a few scrapes and bruises. But none of us, because of sin and our heartless owner, have been spared from pain, from sorrow, from disappointment, from deception, and from cages. And this is where Satan messed up. Remember I said that earlier? You see, Satan doesn't care about his merchandise. He doesn't care about what God has created and everything around us, including ourselves. We are degenerating. Yes. The worse this world looks, the more God wants to save 
I, I, I don't think you heard that one. Think about it. If something looks really bad, if something is doing something really bad, we tend to just say, you know what, let me start over. But the worse we look, the more desperate we, we, we are, the more God wants to help. That's love. Especially since the reason why we are where we are is because we chose not to listen to Him. God is ruled by what we call unconditional love. I, I, I can't see, I, I see that love, the closest love we can get to God's love is the love that parents have for their children. Because even though your child makes a mistake, you don't kick them out and say, I'm changing the locks and good luck, son. No, you, you, you forgive and you work with them and you don't kick them out right away. Now, you may kick them out eventually and you may have good reasons for that, but rarely have I seen that. Even though we chose to trust Satan in his conniving words and the result is degeneration of what God had perfectly created, God loves us even more. Which means that there's nothing you can do to, that will turn him away. And there's also nothing that you can do that will make him more pleased. Because he loves you as you are. Whatever state you're in, he says, I want you to be my child. You are my child. You just haven't understood that yet. Because I've bought you with a life. I gave my son for you. Unlike how we present the things that we want to sell, we always show the best side and we fe feature the best qualities and we always want to make a good impression. Satan didn't count on the fact that the worse we looked, the more he would love. Because Satan doesn't get that. And we see this love, this eagerness for salvation in the verse that introduces what we're about to do today. And this is probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I'll put it on the screen. You may not be able to read it because it's kind of dark. It's in Luke chapter 22. And Jesus in this story is in what we call the upper room. And this is about a couple of hours before he's about to be delivered to be crucified, judged and crucified. And he meets with his disciples. And a tradition in those days, which we don't have anymore today, thank goodness some people would say, is that there was always a servant who would be at the door washing people's feet when they came into a reception like that. And the reason for that is, is that they walked in sandals in those days. And the feet weren't really clean. And so they hired a servant to wash everyone's feet. And then they would sit at the table and eat. But in this case, Jesus didn't hire a servant. He set up the whole thing. Go there. Tell them that, you know, we need a room. And they went up there and there was no servant. And, of course, they all got up there and everybody sat at the table because I'm not washing his feet. He said that to me last week. I'm not washing her feet. She told somebody bad about me. And Jesus begins to kneel down and wash the feet of all of his disciples. And these are the words he says when he gets up there. He says, when the hour had come, this is, we're here now. He says, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire. When I'm really hungry, sometimes I have fervent desires. He says, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. They were singing a song about sitting at the table, at the Lord's table. That's what it's referring to. When we get to heaven, we're going to sit at a table with God. And he says, this is the last time for me. And you know, it's interesting. I did a little digging. The Greek word for fervent is epithumia, which means violence. It actually means violent desire, which is often associated with lust and impure thoughts. So now you can think about your lustful moments. 
whether it's over a chocolate cake, or whether it's over that car, or whether it's over the job position, you can look at that and you can know exactly how you felt inside when you saw that thing. And Jesus was feeling the same thing for dying to save the world. Because he knew that this Passover, the sharing of these two emblems, a little glass of wine and a little piece of unleavened bread, symbolized his death that he was about to go through. And he says, with fervent desire, I've wanted to share this with you. Because once you understand what this means, you will be with me in heaven. I get to be with you. This is not over for me. Yes, I'm going to die, but I am going to be with every single person that I've created with my own hands who accepts me as their personal Savior, who has allowed me to buy them. Because when I die, anybody who accepts that death will be saved. God has bought you with His Son. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, only begotten son. That whosoever will believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, we may die on this earth. But we know that that's not the final death. We know that just as much as Jesus resurrected from the tomb, much like Christian Natara resurrected from the old person into a new person. People who believe and have died in the faith of God will resurrect one day to be with Him in heaven. And this fervent desire that Jesus had just blows me away. He's about to die a horrible death. He's about to be betrayed by His own friends. He's about to be laughed at by the Jewish religion, the religious leaders. He's about to be absolutely disowned by everybody that he's poured his life into. And yet, I can't wait to do this. Finally, everything I've lived for is culminating to this moment where Ingrid, I get to save you. I get to buy you. I get to buy you out of your cage mentality. I get to take you out of that tank and you can swim freely. You can be liberated. We are bought. We are bought. We have the choice to have a new owner. You may not have chosen the first one, but you definitely get to choose the second one. And by default, if you don't choose a second one, then you're owned by the first one. Jesus wanted this more than anything. He couldn't wait to go through this. It mattered to Jesus more than his own life. Why? Because what happened in the upper room is a reminder both for him and for us that his sacrifice is not in vain. Because there are some people who have accepted to be bought. We have two today, and two last week, and thousands and millions all over the world. I guess the question remains, who's going to own you? Who's going to own you? I really believe that life here on earth, I, I'm 51 years old, well, soon to be, I guess, not yet. I feel like 51. What does that feel like? I don't know what I'm talking about. Stick to the script, Francis. I really believe that life here on earth without God is meaningless. Because even the things we long for, they just don't last. Marriages break. Cars rust. Friends betray us. You've been there. You've had the toys, the promotions, the friends, the dreams. Only to see them crushed by divorce, disease, depression, and destruction. You know, I was talking to a man. <clears throat> you may remember this man that we helped some months ago in Haiti. Who lost his two sons 
and his wife lost her leg in the earthquake in Haiti. And he called me last week. He called me to thank our church for the meager $5,000 that we sent over for him to buy a container so that his wife and his daughter can live in a container in the heat of Haiti. And he ended up not being able to buy a container because they were unaffordable. So he ended up renovating his house and making it a little bit smaller. And on the side, he built a school where he can teach him and his wife and his daughter are teaching young people in Haiti who can't go to school anymore. And he's teaching them math, English, and French, and whatever they're teaching them. He's taken the money that we've given them, and instead of making his life better, he's making the life of many other people around him better. For many of these students can't go to school. Yeah, he's experienced disease and depression and destruction. But yet... He's turned something evil into something good. Why? Because he's bought. Because he's bought. Because he's accepted the freedom and the deliverance in Jesus Christ. And anybody who's bought ends up living their life for others. Much like the owner has done for us. That's the example that we have. Unlike our current owner... Who wants to tell you that you just need to live for you. Make sure you're okay. Make sure you're safe. Make sure you enjoy life. Make sure you have the right things to be able to, be able to make it through life. You and I can be bought out of slavery only if we see the goodness of the new owner. And I would be more than happy, along with Tara, because I'm quoting her, to take you down that journey to learn who that owner is. <laughs> because now that she's discovered it, she can't keep it to herself. And neither can I. The very act of partaking of these emblems, because this is all they are, they're just emblems. There's nothing special about what we're about the, the things themselves, they symbolize. When you partake of them, your acceptance to be bought from the hands of Satan. That's all it means. When you partake of these things, you're saying yes to God and you're saying no to the cage and the tank mentality. I want to be free and I want to be liberated. I want my eyes to be open and I want my heart to rejoice for the right things. And it's not you and me that have to pay anything. We are merchandise. We are worthless to Satan. But we are worth the life of Jesus to God. Under our new owners, we are no longer merchandise. We are called children of God. Regardless of what we've done. Regardless of what we have said. Today, when you take this little wafer and this grape juice that we have for you, you are not practicing a ritual. You are accepting to be bought. You are rejoicing in, in, in rejoicing with fervent desire with the one who owns you now. You don't need to be waxed. You don't need to be shined. You don't need a facelift. You've been replaced by the perfect son of God. Stop the fight for perfection. Stop the fight for justification. Stop the fight for redemption. You can only be bought by the loving exchange of Jesus Christ for you. And that is love. Break down your walls of resistance to the love of God and simply accept that you are worth the life of Jesus to God. And if you accept this, then this communion will be more than just a ritual. These baptisms will be more than just a ritual. It will be a life out of the cage. Your freedom bought for you by someone who is willing to die for you. And Jesus couldn't wait 
if Jesus couldn't wait to do this and die, then wouldn't, shouldn't we be just as eager to do this and live? But it all begins, I know, there's always a but to everything. It all begins with a test of humility. The verse that I read earlier says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Jesus, in that upper room with those 12 disciples, Glorify God in the body by first washing the feet of his disciples. And it's interesting because Peter, the bolder of the disciples, the loudmouth, the one that's like me, looked at Jesus and says, you're not washing my feet. There's no way you're doing that. And then Jesus says, well, if I don't do it, then you can't be part of my kingdom. And then, of course, again, loudmouth Peter. Well, they don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. Jesus says, just shut up. Just let me do this with you. You, you just talk too much. You see, this act of humility is a way for you to prepare yourself to truly experience redemption. The exchange. This act of humility makes us equal with one another and able to worship God in spirit to receive the salvation from pain, sorrow, and ultimate death. This is why I always tell you, and you're all at home right now watching this, and you're about to do this with your, 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 your spouse or with your children. I always say, take a minute and just ask each other for forgiveness. Be honest with one another and say, I have done this to you lately. And I am sorry. This should not have been done. Will you forgive me? And you're at home right now in your living room. And you're getting your little basins ready. And, and you've got your little cups with your little emblems. And you're watching this right now. And in, in, in the serenity and the quietness of your home, stop living in the tank. Open up and just be honest. Before your children, share with them the things that you have done that have offended them. And ask each other for forgiveness. And then, and then and only then, watch, wash each other's feet. If Jesus did it with his disciples to prepare them to receive the emblems, then he has asked us to do this in remembrance so that we can also be prepared to receive the emblems. Admit your, to admit your wrongs is to open the door for he who is righteous, long-suffering, and a covenant keeper of God. The only reason why God is asking us to do this is because he is humble and kind. And this is a way for us to also be humble and kind. I will give you 10 minutes now in your home, wherever you are, and glorify God in the body together. Welcome back to all of you. I hope and pray that this was a, a good experience for you. Uh, just a, a time for you to do some internal reflection and, and just to draw closer to those that you love uh, during, during this time. Before we share the emblems, I'd like to just share one more story. It's found in the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. And um, uh, sometimes we don't always understand why God does the things he does. And uh, definitely this is one of those where Hosea was a man who was speaking on behalf of God to the people of Israel. And at one point, God asked him to go and marry a prostitute. And... Um, I'll read it to you. It says here, Then the Lord said to me, Go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover. Which means this is the second time he asks her to go and be with a prostitute. Go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. 
So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot anymore, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be towards you. God here is showing us again that were it not for him, we would be totally lost. Lost to our idolatrous ways or what the verse says here, our love for raisin cakes of the pagans. Hosea went and purchased a prostitute, which is a synonym for merchandise. That's you and me. There was nothing attractive about marrying a prostitute. She was worth less than a slave, for a slave cost 30 pieces of silver. He only paid 15 for her. But by buying her, he now owned her. She no longer had to sell herself for pleasure, sustenance, and meaning. God has bought you and me. And he owns us. And look at the advice that he gives us. Number one, he says, stay for a while. For a prostitute would go into a home and within 30 minutes or whatever it is, I don't know, she would be gone. But he says, no, you're going to stay. And then number two, he says, sin is not good for you. You're not going to play the harlot anymore. Sin is hurting you. And you know it and I know it. And now I have bought you. You don't have to go anywhere anymore. I own you. Last, thirdly, he says, we're going to get to know each other because you're not going to have a relationship with another man anymore. You're just going to have a relationship with me. And I know it's going to be hard. I know it takes a while to get out of the cage mentality, but it's going to work. Trust me, it's going to work because I own you now. And lastly, I am not going to use you like these other men have used you. He even says, I will not sleep with you. And God says the same thing. He says, I will not tempt you. He will keep you from harmful behaviors that hurted you in the past and are hurting you now. You can rest assured that being with God will heal you from what previously has hurt you. So the idea of being bought is hopefully by now is not so foreign to you. And maybe not repulsive. It took a while for our cat Buttons to figure it out, but eventually he embraced his freedom until his last breath. He was the most amazing cat we ever owned. Whether you have already given your life to Christ or you're on a journey to do what Tara and Christian just did today and Felicia and Lainey last week, we take these emblems today as a way to celebrate your new life. As a way to commit and recommit your life to accepting that God has bought you. And that you embrace your new owner. Right now I would like to invite us to glorify God in our spirit. Let me pray over the bread and just for those of you who may not know before I pray all you have to do is remove the top little plat uh, transparent layer you can do that now if you'd like and when you do that the little piece of bread will be accessible for you and then after we take the bread and we'll pray over the wine then you take off the other layer and then you can drink you can drink the grape juice now that you've removed the top layer, let me have a prayer 
over this bread that symbolizes Jesus' body. Heavenly Father, we have gathered today here and online to celebrate you. I wonder, Jesus, what we would have done had we been there. Will we have listened to the voice of reason, the voice of the world, or will we have heard your words and just be broken by this act of selflessness that you have done for us? But today we are here. We are in our home, surrounded by our children that we love, next to our spouse maybe, next to a mom and a dad as a family together, as we've gathered together recognizing today that we no longer are slaves to sin. Because of this body that was broken for us, this body of yours, you were willing to die on the cross and say, whoever believes in me will not perish but have eternal life. Today, Father, we thank you by taking this, this little piece of unleavened wafer, we, we are recognizing, accept this as a thank on our part for what you have done for us and as a willingness for us to be part of this transaction of having a new owner that is Father God in heaven. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the salvation that has been graciously given to us even though we don't deserve it. And today as we have stepped into the, the place of humility, asking forgiveness for one another, and washing each other's feet, all equal before God, all of us equal before God, we say thank you and we accept this sacrifice and we accept your salvation. In your name I pray. Amen. And in the Bible it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the, the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are indebted to you. And as you take the next layer off of your little cup, maybe, take your time. Just take a little bit of it off. Don't take the whole thing. I like to pray over the wine. Heavenly Father, these are just emblems. We know that. But they symbolize hope and life for us. You never promised us that there wouldn't be hard times in life. But you told us that you would be with us next to us every step of the way. You know, blood is, is the life of a body. Without blood, a life can't live. It transports uh, nutrients to the cells. It keeps us breathing. It, it gets purified. It, it is life. And when we look at this grape juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for you, for us, once again, we can only say thank you. Because your blood was spilled, ours will not have to be spilled. Because your blood was spilled, you have given us a chance to eternal life. And by accepting this gift that you have given us, we are free now. We are liberated now. We are given a new life. Some of us today were baptized some of us symbolized that commitment to you, accepting your blood as their salvation, symbolizing the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the rest of us today, we join Christian and Tara by partaking of these emblems and, and recommitting our life to you, rejoicing in your salvation and accepting 
the grace that you have given us, Father. We, we, we deserve nothing but to accept this gift. We thank you from the bottom of our heart and we tell you today that we want to know you better so that our life will resemble that of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In your name I pray. Amen. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.